millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Welcome to episode number 346 of Real Life Ghost Stories and I have two spooky stories for you today and the last story comes from March the 13th 2024 and story number one comes from Billy. I was 10 years old in June of 1990 when my parents split up and soon after divorced. At that time we lived in Colorado Springs, Colorado where my father was stationed at Fort Collins. We were a military family and an outdoorsy family as it was, or at least my father and I were. My mother and older sister not so much. I loved camping, hiking, fishing and horseback riding. So when my parents split up and my mother took my sister to Price, Utah to live with our grandmother, it was a bit of a change for me, not to mention a culture shock. We moved there in November of 1990. So in January of 1991, my birth month, I just wanted to get outside and camp and hike. And as an 11-year-old kid who was very hurt and angry about all these changes that no one seemed to care how it made me feel, I begged and I pleaded and I threw tantrums. I was new to the desert and was more than curious. I wanted to explore. At this time, my mother had started dating this man, They had been dating about two months in February of 1991 when he told my mother he would be glad to take us camping. He told me he understood why I was so angry and wanted me to be happy. Sounds great, right? So at the end of February, he took my sister, who was five years older than me, myself and my mother out to the San Rafael Desert in southern Utah to camp for two nights. I was so excited. Right before we were to leave, my mother's work called and told her she would have to work Saturday even though she had requested the weekend. But low man on the totem pole and all, no choice was given. It was either come into work or don't come back. We left Friday to go to the desert. And on Saturday morning after breakfast, my mother left for work and took my older sister, who had her learner's permit and was wanting to get more driving practice in. That left me alone with the boyfriend. At first it was fine. We hiked up a mesa to a cave where he showed me some very cool Native American cave paintings. Showed me how to look for arrowheads and flint and all in all was telling me about the Navajo and Paiute peoples who had inhabited the area. I was fascinated. Then, like a cloud passing over the sun, his mood darkened very, very quickly. To this day I don't know if this was something I had done or if it was just because of me. He started to tell me that I was not a good child, that I was a brat who didn't deserve his kindness and knowledge. He told me my mother deserved a better daughter. He told me everyone would be better if I would just walk off into the desert and disappear. He told me my mother felt the same and that's why she agreed to go out to the desert to camp to get rid of me. She hated camping. I knew that. So what he was saying was making sense to my 11-year-old brain. Now, just in case you're not aware of the desert weather in Utah in the winter, it can be very beautiful in the day in the 70s, just to drop below freezing at night. So on this day, it was nice, so I wasn't wearing a coat, just jeans and a t-shirt. He told me that I should run so he wouldn't have to hurt me. He then started loading what I believed to be a 38. I was young and not as knowledgeable as I am now with firearms. So I ran. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. I was just crying and running and very scared. I've no idea how long I ran for or how far. All I knew is I needed to get away and out of sight, which is what I did. So when I finally felt safe enough to stop running, when I couldn't see the camp or smoke from the fire, I started to look for somewhere to hide. 
I found another cave and sat inside it for a good bit of time. Not sure how much time elapsed, but I knew I couldn't stay there. He would find me, I thought, and then that would be it, the end. I thought I had no one, so I needed to find someone, but how and where? I remembered my father teaching me that if you were ever lost in the mountains, to find a river if possible, and follow it downstream, and that would most likely lead you to a town, city, or civilization of some sort. So that's what I did. I found out later that week that in the desert you are supposed to go upstream and not down. I still don't know if that's true, but that's what they told me then. So I remembered from our drive-in the previous day there was a river somewhere nearby, so I went off to find it. And find it I did. I then proceeded to follow it downstream, walking somewhat blindly while lost in thought about my mom not wanting me and how I should never have begged to go out there. This was all my fault, and I was probably going to die out there, and that was all my fault too. Why was I such a brat? The sun was starting to go down now. If I were to throw out a guess, it was probably about 4.30ish, maybe 5pm by now. I had been walking since around 10am. The temperature was starting to drop and I started to cry again. I was scared. I wasn't paying attention and I tripped and fell into this small river. Great, now I was alone, scared and wet. I was going to die out there. I just knew it. The shock of the water snapped my brain into thinking and I realised I needed shelter. I had at this time no idea if there were predators here and if so, what kind? Bears? Wolves? I had no idea. I didn't want to die. I wanted to tell my mom I was sorry and to please let me come home. I would never make her do this again and I would be a good girl. I didn't want to die. I found another small cave, not much bigger than a coat closet. Well, maybe not even a cave, more of a small alcove that afforded me coverage and I curled up into a ball under my t-shirt and tried to calm myself. I was so cold and the temperature was steadily dropping. If I remember correctly, it got down to 38 that night. Not below freezing, but at the time it felt like it. Then the howling and the yips started. They told me it was coyotes. Maybe it was, and my scared, overreacting brain freaked. But to this day I have never seen coyotes that big, nor have I seen them walk upright. There were several of them, maybe five. But they were moving around me so quickly in the darkness, and it was so dark. The only light was from the half moon and it was not illuminating a lot. I look back now and I'm glad it wasn't. These things just seemed to circle me throughout the night, almost like they were curious or maybe just messing with me. They did get close enough for me to see that they looked like really big scary dogs, but they didn't seem to be threatening me if that makes sense. Though at the time I didn't care what they wanted, they needed to go away or kill me and make it quick. At least I hoped it would be quick. Sadly enough, I thought this to be more preferable to freezing to death or starving to death. I had already resigned myself to one or the other. Now this. I have no idea how I fell asleep or if I passed out from fright. But I woke up and it was very early dawn. That in-between time similar to twilight and I was alone again. My legs were numb and it was hard to walk. I would get strange shooting pains through the numbness every time I took a step. I was hungry and thirsty and wanted my mom. I started crying again and telling myself out loud that it was my fault and that I did this to myself. When I saw it, it looked like a large dog or a wolf. It was staring at me from the top of a ridge. It yipped at me, then ran the other direction. I stared at it dumbly, unsure of what to do next. Would it eat me? Would it leave me alone? What do I do? Then there it was again. At least I think it was the same one, but this one was now at the bottom of the ridge, maybe a football field away from me. And it too yipped at me. But this time it didn't turn away. It turned around and walked away from me slowly and kept turning to look at me. Every time it would look back at me, it would yip again like it wanted me to follow it. So me, having nothing else to do with my day, followed. I mean, at this point, I couldn't see it getting much worse. I followed it for maybe an hour, maybe longer. The sun had come up completely when it finally stopped and turned around and stared at me for what seemed like forever. Until the noise of an engine could be heard. 
and then just like that it took off and the truck came into view. It was a state park ranger out looking for me. I have never been so happy. I started to attempt to jump up and down but fell due to my legs and feet. He jumped out of his truck, scooped me up and placed me in the passenger seat where he radioed in that I had been found. He gave me a Snickers and a Coke and boy I tell you to this day it was the best Snickers and Coke I'd ever had. I found out that I had severe hypothermia and frostbite on 90% of both of my feet. They wanted to cut off my toes. I'm glad my mother didn't allow that, though to this day I have nerve damage in all of them and if my feet get cold the pain is excruciating. I also found out that my mother didn't want me left out there. He wanted my mom to himself and I was in the way. To my knowledge they never found him. He left the desert that day, called my mom at work to tell her I was gone and that she was free. Apparently, upon listening to her response, he realised he had made a mistake, so he ran. They told me I must have been hallucinating the big dog, coyote, wolf things due to the hypothermia. When I was 15, I was with my best friend, who is full-blooded Navajo, and she asked me to tell her great-grandmother about what happened to me and what I had seen. She told me of a legend her grandmother told her, about a family of skinwalkers who were supposedly in the San Rafael Swell, who were not known to be hostile or harmful. They just wanted to be left alone. Maybe it was a hallucination brought on by my 11-year-old mind and hypothermia, or maybe not all monsters are monsters. And in my experience, the only monster in my story was of the human kind. But in any case, thank you to whatever or whoever it was. I'm alive because of it. I still have a hard time with it to this day. I get emotionally unstable if I get too cold or if I feel lost and I don't know where I am. I can't control it. I know it's a form of PTSD. Billy, I'm so sorry that you had to go through this and what an absolute spineless rat bastard that man was. And I know there will be people who are listening to this story who will think, there's no way somebody could do that to a child. There's no way a man could drive out into the desert with a child and then leave them there. There's, There's just no way that would happen. Well, let me tell you, sometimes people enter into a relationship and let me tell you that they only want that person and anybody else that is in the vicinity of that person is seen as an obstacle, as a barrier that gets in the way between those two people just being together. And oh, oh, that's made me so cross. And of course, little 11 year old you who is already struggling with the emotions of the divorce and the big move, etc, etc. Of course, you're going to believe what an adult tells you. Of course you are. And of course, when you were found by... The ranger and explained what had happened and when you said look I I saw this big wolf coyote type thing that led me to safety of course they were going to go oh it's probably just your imagination right because that's how adults I don't know deal with these things that children say we say yeah of course it's just your imagination you know and maybe it is just your imagination you know maybe it is something that you invented in your brain but isn't it incredible if that is the case that your brain invented something that led you straight to safety without you having any concept of where in the desert you were and without you having any concept that this safety was coming to get you. Like that concept in itself is simultaneously terrifying and fascinating. I myself had never experienced the desert until last year when I went out to the Grand Canyon and genuinely it is one of the most magical beautiful, desolate, terrifying places that I have ever been to. I know this is going to sound really stupid, but it is so vast. It is so vast. So I cannot even imagine what the fear is like being out there on your own night or day. And as for the skinwalker element of the story, um, I made a bit of a resolution that I would not speak about skinwalkers like I had some sort of authority. (laughs) anymore I know I've done episodes on skinwalkers in the past but I have had native people reach out to me and say hey don't please don't do that please don't do that and I respect that and I am trying to listen to that if that makes sense also there's this academic called Adrienne Keane and she wrote very succinctly we as native people are now opened up to a barrage of questions about these beliefs and traditions but these are not things that need or should be discussed by outsiders at all I'm sorry if that seems unfair, but that's how our cultures survive. And reading that and hearing from native people who have contacted me sort of changed my perspective on it. And that's not me saying, Billy, I'm trying to delegitimize your story or I'm trying to say you shouldn't write in about skinwalkers. That's not what I'm saying at all. 
because your experience was your experience. But what I am saying is that I'm not going to speak on it like I'm some sort of authority because I am most definitely not. The only thing I'm going to say is that if I had that experience and a Navajo woman told me a story that seemed to corroborate my experiences and she told me a story and said, you know, there's always been there's always been a story among us that there were a family of skinwalkers who lived out that way. That's what I, I would that's what I would be taking away from this story. I'd be like, okay, that's what I experienced. For whatever reason, I was kept safe and I would never question it again. But to be really serious for a second, Billy, I'm really sorry that you went through that. I'm obviously very thankful that you came out the other end of it. Obviously not unscathed because PTSD has followed you for the rest of your life. And I would not wish PTSD on anybody. It is a really horrible, dark, terrifying thing to experience. But that's a very powerful and poignant point that the real monster in your story was a person, a very real human person. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom. Like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. And story number two comes from Norm. My house has been quiet for a while now. But from day one of living here, there has been a series of very odd things happening. But before getting into that, I should explain that I am a small s scientist, which is to say that I look for reasonable and rational explanations wherever possible. I understand and trust the scientific method, and my education is in a field that is based on evidence and things working as they are designed to. However, sometimes things happen that have no rational explanation. When I was a kid of 17 or 18 or so, for some reasons that I have long since forgotten, I had the house to myself for a week. So one sunny morning I did what every red-blooded lad of that age does when presented with the privacy of a house to themselves. I went for a bike ride through the fields around my town and as it happens, and as I'm sure we have all experienced, I managed to get about 20 grass seeds stuck in the fabric of my socks. When I got home around mid-afternoon, I sat cross-legged on the sofa and pulled each one out, setting it on the corner of the table next to me. The first grass seed came out of my sock and went on the table. The second grass seed came out of my sock and went on the table, where it sat, alone. The first grass seed was gone. Third grass seed came out and sat on the table, alone. By now there should have been three. I even swept my hand across the surface of the table as if to brush the grass seeds into my other hand, as one would with breadcrumbs after breakfast. There were definitely no grass seeds there. The same thing kept happening until the grass seeds were out of my sock, but there were no other grass seeds on the table. That evening I sat back down with a cool, refreshing glass of lemonade and saw a pile of twenty or so grass seeds on the corner of the table. I set my glass down and swept the seeds into my hand. I threw them out the window. No, not threw, drop kicked. Other things happened in that house. Keys going missing and then turning up on the bed, things moving, all that delightful stuff. But the grass seeds were the hardest to explain away. There was also the guy who wasn't there, who used to hang out at the end of the bar of a pub that I used to work in. And some other things, but I feel like this could be long enough. Just to say, 
I like to have rational explanations for things that happen, but it's not always possible. Some of it could be put down to hallucinations, but not everything. So, new house, day one, evening. Everything had been moved in. I was standing with my family in the living room, probably holding a cup of tea while we discussed which establishment to employ to deliver that evening's meal. A small movement caught my attention and I glanced towards it. And I saw a little girl standing on the stairs looking back at me between the balusters of the banister. The girl was sitting on the stairs just at that point. So she was slightly above eye level to where I was standing. She had long blonde hair and wore a nightdress. She was pale, but not unhealthily so. Certainly not enough to suggest a demise. It seems hilarious now, but genuinely my first thought was that she was the youngest daughter of the family we bought the house from. I looked at my wife, who was further into the room, and then passed her to my own kids. I looked back at the stairs. She was still there. This time, she gave a small start, like a child might if they were trying to spy on the grown-ups from the stairs, but had been caught doing it. And like a child might, she turned to her right and, on all fours, clambered up the stairs and out of sight. I checked. There was nobody hiding anywhere upstairs. There was, and is, nowhere to hide. No cupboards, no loose floorboards. The loft is a conversion and pretty much open plan. No boxes were open or unaccounted for. No windows were open. So that was our new house on day one. Since then, on more than one occasion, my dogs have been barking in the hallway and I've heard a shh, go to bed, followed by the dogs quietly going into their bed and then footsteps going up the stairs. Each time I assumed my eldest had come home early, only she wasn't in the house. Each time a quick text confirmed that she was still out. I checked. There was nobody hiding anywhere upstairs. There was... Or is nowhere to hide, no loose floorboards, there is a loft conversion, and that is pretty much open plan. No cupboards or wardrobes were open or unaccounted for, no windows were open, beds had nothing unexpected under them. Last year we went on a long weekend break abroad, leaving the dogs and the house in the hands of my daughter's friend and her boyfriend. So they were watching the house and feeding the dogs for four days. On day two, I think it was, my daughter got a text message that read, verbatim, your house is haunted as fuck. From the very first day, there were footsteps throughout the house, doors opening and closing, and while they were in bed in the loft, from the bottom of the stairs leading up into the roof, they both heard a child's voice. Mummy? That was almost a year ago. Like I said... The house has been quiet for a while now, no voices talking to the dogs, no footsteps, nobody sitting on the stairs and no children asking for their mother. There are a couple of reasonable explanations. First, we had a cleverly concealed frogger who has now moved out. Second, the footsteps were pigeons on the roof, the child's voice was a neighbour in their garden and the opening and closing doors were caused by changing air pressure due to an open window, or, or, or perhaps there's a child living in the house who has adopted us as her new family and has a relationship with the dogs that means they'll follow her instructions. Maybe she missed us while we were away and had house sitters in. Maybe she was asking for my wife to whom I deeply and unreservedly apologise for raising that idea with her while we were lying in bed, listening to the story of our house being read back to us. So, just to say, I completely misinterpreted what you meant when you said, first, we had a cleverly concealed frogger. I was like, A, what's a frogger? Googled it. A frogger is somebody who, like, lives inconspicuously, surreptitiously in your house. You know, they live in your house and you don't know that they're there, which honestly gives me the heebie-jeebies but I recognize now that you were saying that as a hypothetical answer to to the things that had happened in your house and um, I didn't read it like that and immediately went you had a frogger living in your house that's the real story we want to know about Uh, and honestly when I realized I was like okay you need to think about things Emma before you jump to mad conclusions I did love the grass seed story like I don't understand what happened there 
Like if they had just simply blown off the table or were swept off the table, they wouldn't be then back on the table in a nice little pile. Did you just drop them into an alternate universe and the alternate universe then spat them back out later? So as you guys know, I'm very into um, (laughs) multiple universe theories at the moment. The multiverse theory, if you will, and time slips, etc. So what if the girl that was sitting on the stairs looking at you guys, you know, what what if what if it wasn't a ghost that you saw? What if it was a time slip? What if it was a uh, another human being, another person seeing you? as ghosts like I can imagine some girl writing into the podcast and being like so when I was a kid I heard all this sound this noise downstairs and I went downstairs and I was sitting on the stairs looking through the bars and there was a whole family in the living room that didn't live there I'd never seen them before and then the dad of the family turned and looked at me and I ran back up the stairs and jumped under the covers and I don't know how I slept that night but I did and look like you said there are ways that you could explain all of these things like you know, maybe you had a a very small frogger. I don't think that you did. Maybe the footsteps were pigeons on the roof. When I lived in my previous house, the pigeons would have a field day on the roof and it would sound like little footsteps running around. They also could have been rats, but I'm going to say pigeons because it makes me feel better. And yes, it could have been a neighbor's child. It could have been opening and closing doors due to air pressure. All of those things. Yes, absolutely. But when all of those things are happening around the same time that's when I start to ask questions you know if all those things are happening individually over a long period of time you'd say oh you wouldn't even take notice of them you'd just be like oh there's pigeons on the roof you know a couple of months later oh that was next door's kid shouting for their mom you know that kind of thing but when all of these things are happening and you're not the only person experiencing them and your dogs are reacting to things to me that 100% says haunting and um, I am also sorry to your wife who is sitting listening to this right now thank you so much to Billy and Norm for sending in your stories remember the last story came from March the 13th 2024 and if you would like to send in your story you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com you can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com and if you are desperate for some extra content you can subscribe to the Patreon that is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free and on that note I shall see you next time Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. That's what you'll feel with Bowl and Branch's organic cotton sheets. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bowl and Branch sheets get softer with every wash. Start getting your best night's sleep in these sheets that get softer and softer for years to come. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee. Plus get 15% off your first order at bowlandbranch.com. Code BUTTERY. Exclusions apply. See site for details.